Rick's Corner, the man, the myth, the legend, now on with the show. Welcome to Rick's Corner. I have a friend named Nicholas here today, Nick, we say, Nick and Rick, and he called me about doing a podcast on his show, which he's starting out, and I said, sure, I'll be glad to help you out with it. So while we're shooting the podcast, I thought we would shoot it as my show so we could see what we're doing, and then he can go ahead and air it on his for the audio version, and we'll just have fun with it. Does that sound okay? okay. Sounds perfect. Okay, it's your show now, so I'm turning it over to you. Well, first and foremost, I appreciate you taking the time to do this, because I literally emailed you maybe not even 24 hours ago. Yes. Spur of the moment. You got back to me in 20 minutes. I do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we set this up real quick, so yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I've been a fan of yours for a little while, and like we were talking about before, um, I remember uh, watching your videos on, on YouTube, and with that ring right outside, mm -hmm. um, and all the training that you did, and seeing this, and actually being in here with this, this I guess you can say it's iconic, yeah. Uh, yeah, in relation to you. Yeah, uh, it's really cool and and surreal. So I appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this with me. No, oh, I like doing stuff like this. I think it's fun and it helps everybody out. I like to help people out with what I can do. I have a world of knowledge that's going to take with me at some point. But mm. if I let it out now, everybody can share it. No, yeah, for sure. And like I was telling you yesterday when we were on the phone, um, that that era because I'm a, I'm a fan of bodybuilding and I have been for years. But that era with you know Arnold, you Ferrigno, all those guys. Yeah. Um, there's not too much information out there uh, now about that because now it's a new age with like you know uh, Victor Martinez and Dexter Jackson, all those guys. Yeah. So I mean, the golden era of bodybuilding is definitely something I would like to talk to you about and get into, but um, and also wrestling. Wrestling. Well, okay. Well, the problem with the golden era nowadays is that many of them aren't here anymore, and the ones that are who are my age, um, they've got one foot in the grave. They don't want to be bothered. They don't want to talk. They're kind of old and cranky and they just don't care. Which is too bad because there's a lot of history back there that needs to be brought forward. And that's what I've been trying to do on my show. Um, because I lived it and not many people around who lived it can talk about it nowadays. That's something I'm so fascinated by because I was, again, like I was telling you yesterday when we spoke for the first time on the phone, yeah. I was reading Arnold's Encyclopedia. And all that knowledge in there, I mean, it's it's dated, but it's it's the meat and potatoes of weightlifting. It's the meat and potatoes of bodybuilding. Yes. It and, and it's that information that I feel is just getting lost in the shuffle, especially with all that stuff out now, because bodybuilding is so scientific. So I, I would like to dive into that with you and just, you know, um, relive those days on Venice Beach, that deli you were telling me about, um, World's Gym, Gold's Gym, all that stuff, training with these guys, Arnold Frigno. You know the Olympias, all that stuff. I want to dive into with you because that's something that I've been passionate about uh, since shoot, I was 15, 16 years old. I mean, I'm not jacked by any means, but it's definitely something I study and admire. Yeah, no, no, I understand that. Um, the thing is, the difference between then and now is the gym was like right down the street from me. As I've told a lot of people on here, I was maybe less than a mile away. I had a beach apartment, two bedroom, two bath on the beach. Oh, I have to walk off the beach for 165 a month which is unheard of. Um, the gym, which is still there, is now a house, and from the front it does say Gold's Gym, but you'd go into the back, and this is a big center block building with all the weights that Joe Gold had made, and there, in the morning, I'd go in the morning, be Arnold and Draper and Franco and some of those guys, even Frank Zane be training there, and there was no music, because Joe didn't allow it, but there was good training and good relationships. Uh, we joked around a lot, and it was fun to do with between sets cracking jokes and making each other laugh, but we also were serious. And basically, it, it was just basic sets and reps, which a lot of people don't realize that they have all these exotic moves they're doing with balls and, and, and doing uh, uh, lunges across the gym and all this other kind of stuff, which we never did. And we never did cardio because there was no cardio machines, nothing. And there were no water bottles, so we had a water fountain over there and waited in line to get water. And so um, it was quite different. I mean, if we wanted to do any cardio at all, we'd go across the street and run down to the pier and run between piers for a little while. But that wasn't even a steady thing. That was just once in a while. I was going to ask because no one. I whenever I read these old articles, I never hear anything about cardio. No, no cardio. I didn't know anything about macros and counting all this and counting that. And so someone said, "Well, how would you diet?" I said, "We eat high protein, low carb." 
Well, all year round, yeah, all year round, high protein, low carb. And well, what about fiber? Well, I take Metamucil, or maybe I have a salad. Um, cheese omelet, cottage cheese was a good source of protein. Beef patties on the grill, steaks, chicken breasts, um, eggs. Uh, and there wasn't much in the way of protein drinks because there was no protein out except for Weir's, which we didn't take because we didn't know how good it was. <laughs> wasn't quite sure about his stuff anyway. Um, you could go to the health food store and buy protein, but it was by Hoffman. And it wasn't even real protein. I think it was soy, oh. or it was ground up fish, which was like, oh no, no, I don't want that stuff. So it, basically, it was real food. Yeah, I was gonna say. Now, as far as like what those protein shakes were back then, because I remember you you getting endorsed by uh, someone for free supplements, basically, right? Oh, I get that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, back then. Yeah. Arnold, I think Arnold introduced you to somebody. Yeah, uh, real Blair. Right. What What was in his protein shakes? Nobody's quite sure. <laughs> His protein, um, I'm not quite sure what the basis of it was, but you're supposed to mix it with cream and make a pudding out of it. Mm. Uh, it was higher in fat and no carbs, tasted really good, and it was very, very expensive. I mean, someone duplicated it today and they like, they want a lot of money for it, several hundreds of dollars for like a tub. But it was good stuff, Larry Scott and all the guys ate it, but we got it for free because we would exchange, do um, maybe photo shoots for him with his products. Then he had a whole bunch of vitamins that you would take, and I don't know if you saw it in my kitchen there, but I have a vitamin bottle in there with a, a light bulb in the top, and I made a paper mache body, a bodybuilder, and I hand painted it, and it's sitting in my windowsill, and that's the real Blair B complex vitamin bottle that I've had for 45 years. Really? If somebody wanted to buy it, I said, no, I don't want to sell it. It's, a, it's like an iconic thing. You made that though, right? I did. Especially since you made it, that's a labor of love and having it that yep. long without it breaking. I mean, yep. I know you have kids so and yep. pets, so I'm, without one of them knocking it over nope. in 45 years. It's in perfect shape and it's sitting in my window still. It's just sitting there. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, you know, again, I'm so fascinated by these these old stories. So whatever you have and you want to share, feel free. But um, as far as like, what when you first started getting into weightlifting, what, what was... Because I know people my age, everyone's like, oh, you know, I, when I first opened uh, Muscle and Fitness and Arnold was in it, Arnold motivated me to do it, but who was the guy for you that you're like, wow, I want to be like this guy? Well, I never really wanted to be like anybody. I know that's hard to believe because everybody has a hero, but I just wanted to be me, but I wanted to be a, a good me. Mm -hmm. So the magazines that we get back then didn't have Arnold in it. They had Dave Draper. Mm -hmm. They had two uh, uh, twin brothers from Canada, uh, Yvonne and Pierre Brunet, who were really well built. A couple of guys, oh, if you want to go way back, it's their uh, Kimon Voyages and Steve Reeves and names like that that a lot of people, uh, George Eiferman, for example, um, Jack LaLanne, who was a different type of bodybuilder. But these guys were well built, and I used to read the magazines and look at their routines. Reg Park is another one. And all they did was lift. I mean, it, it was nothing exotic. It was bench press and squats and deadlifts and curls and tricep extensions. And then Bill Pearl, of course, was like one of my number one guys I liked. I thought he had a fantastic body. He always trained at five in the morning. His, his photo shoots were done in his gym under a skylight because the skylight comes down and gives you a great look for the camera. But he did basic movements too. I mean, like at benches, inclines, and side flies with dumbbells. There was nothing exotic. So I just kind of followed that routine. and. I didn't really have a hero. I just wanted to be good at what I did. So I would look in the mirror and I started to see things happen. And I had a girlfriend that was older than me and people know this story. She's the one that got me into it. She was a homecoming queen and a swim team and this and that. And then when I started getting some muscle, she says, oh, you're getting too big. This is not good. I said, well, no, this is what we want to do. <laughs> so I had to make excuses for it because uh, this is what I wanted. And sometimes women don't get it. You know, you get better looks than they do and they get upset and jealous because you're getting more looks. You know, it's crazy. You get more looks from the guys. Once yeah. you're jacked, once like, oh, dude, nice packs. What yeah. do you do? You know, yeah, you stuff. do. You do. You get a lot of looks from guys. Um, and the women, yeah. But back then, um, in the 70s, um, I was a different breed of people. <laughs> we would uh, go out on Fridays and Saturday nights to uh, Marina del Rey, mm. which is only a mile from the gym. And Marina del Rey is where all the boats are docked, and you have the clubs like Duncan's Inn and Captain's Wharf, and that night they have music, and all the women come out and guys come out to have their drinks and dance and get to meet people for dates. So we'd go in there, we were the only bodybuilders that even go out or anywhere and they'd look at us and they'd say, oh my God, look what just walked in the door. They were like, they didn't know what to make of us. The guys looked at us like, wow, who's those guys? And the women said, oh my God, if I can only feel his arms. You know, so it was kind of fun. So we met a lot of people, we met a lot of women and this is where we made our dates. But 
We had I had a little thing. I said I'd take if I met somebody there it was dark, I'd take him outside by the, the bouncer and I'd hold him under the light and if they pass the light test, I'd take him home with it and I'd throw him back in. <laughs> it's like catching fish and throwing him back in the water. But uh, those were fun times. Nine times out of ten, all of us would end up with somebody. We'd go back to their place, end up making us eggs and steak and all that at one o'clock in the morning and whatever happened, happened and then I go home. It sounds back then you guys were living the life. You know, and it, it's funny because people, the commodity in the gym like it was back then doesn't even exist anymore. No. You know, because, I mean, the the group of guys that you had back then, I, I'm assuming everyone was friends for the most part. Yeah. You know, but now people are going to the gym and it's like, uh, well, there was no music in your gym. Well, Joe Gold didn't allow it. Right. So there was no music. So, I mean, you didn't have headphones in. Nope. You didn't have your hoods over your head. No. Nope. As far as I know, I don't know. No. Nope. Um, so. We actually trained in tank tops and shorts barefoot. That's crazy. The shoes weren't required. It was the short, short, shorts, like the dolphin shorts, because mm -hmm. you could train your legs and look at them and see how they're developing. I mean, that's what it's all about in the gym anyway. And they say, oh, my, why are you guys staring at yourself? Well, we're really not. If you're wearing a tank top and shorts, you're looking in the mirror to see how your muscle development works, and you're watching your exercise and watching things happen. When you look at something and you're training it and you're watching it grow, you're motivated to train even harder. Mm -hmm. If you're hiding in a sweatshirt and you can't see it, then you don't even know what's going on in there. That's true. It's, it's a whole different deal. You know, if I were to wear those dolphin shorts in my gym yeah. and train without shoes on, yeah, not they, to, they'd throw my ass out in two seconds. Yeah. But I have videos running like that. People are like, what are, what's with those shorts? I said, you idiot. It was back then. Some 25-year-old guy said, well, what, why would people do that? Well, you weren't even born yet, so how are you going to know? And what a stupid question to ask us. But people do that, and this is what it was like. And we were at the beach, and the sand's right there, and you run down, and you run back, and your feet are barefoot because you're going in the ocean. So uh, that was all part of it, and Arnold always said you could train calves better on bare feet. Really? You can grip the little bar, the little stool better, I mean, the, the, the thing for your feet, and it could grip it better, you could extend better and come down better, so he trained barefoot. That's crazy. And I, then we did a lot of donkey races. Yes, that's something that's also, I've been to one gym in my entire life that had a donkey calf race machine. Well, there's, they're around, but we would have two people jump on our back. And then we'd do as many reps as we could get, and one would hop off, and you finish off with that one person. And people today say, well, that's kind of weird that you would have people sitting on you and touching you. No, that's how we did donkey races. Yeah, the mentality people have now, it's like uh, those old gyms that were just dark and gritty and just, I don't want to say dingy and dirty, but, you know, aesthetically they look that way. Yeah. Those type of gyms are, you know, what hardcore bodybuilding fans enjoy. And I, I personally like going to those kind of gyms. I, I don't do like those, like... No disrespect to these gyms, but I mean like Equinox and 24-Hour Fitness where there's like fluorescent lights all over the place and yeah. clean barbells. It's not, uh, Don't get me wrong, sanita sanitary is No, is you gotta fine. have that. But I, I like that dark, like dungeon-like environment, you know, because that's, that's when you feel like, wow, these are what the, the I don't want to, I guess forefathers of bodybuilding is what, you know, that group that you're a part of. I don't know, I only had one father. <laughs> um, before Gold's in Santa Monica, there was a place called The Dungeon. I think it was on 4th or 5th Street downstairs, and it had pipes running around the wall that were leaking water because it was under a building, mm. and it had all the hardcore weights. Dave Draper trained there and a few other guys, but they got their workouts in, and they had good workouts. It was conducive to training hard because that's why you went down there, to really hit it hard. And um, I wished I would have had the camera back then, took pictures of it, but I didn't have it. I can't even find it on the Internet. But that closed down, and then they opened up Muscle Beach Gym, um, Muscle Beach Gym started on the beach in the 50s. You had Steve Reeves and all the guys down in the sand posing and working out with the weights on wooden benches. And then they moved up the street under the Surf Rider Motel. They had a big parking structure and they moved the gym up there to get them off the beach because there was a complaint about uh, too much uh, uh, other bodybuilders were hitting up g girls and you know, trying to have sex with young girls down there. So they got them off the beach and then they moved to a, a gym. Muscle Beach Gym moved to Broadway and uh, Fourth in another big building, and right next to it was a, a smorgasbord. That's an all-you-can-eat place. Um, all you can eat for three ninety-five. So the guys would go next door and they eat all these loads of chicken, and they take their workout bags and throw the chicken in the bag and take it home and eat it. So the owner finally came out. It's not all you can eat anymore. It's the best you can eat. You can only get like a few pieces. So they ruined it for everybody. But that, that was the way it was. <laughs> Um, different lifestyle totally and then we had Zookie's Deli on 5th and Wilshire which still has the sign up because it's a landmark and we'd meet there at night around 10 30 or 11 have cheese omelets and then go home and went to bed but that was like a gathering place and like you said the camaraderie was great we were all friends so we did we'd meet up and sit and laugh and talk and whatever you know just talk about training whatever we did and then we go home next morning get up and go to the gym again what time would you guys hit it in the morning around nine did you feel like, because personally when I train that early, I, I usually go like 
10, 10, 30, 11, around that time. If I go any earlier than that, my body's aching, I'm hurting, my elbows are sore. No, it doesn't bother me. Cracking. I go even now at nine. Um, I use it, I drive or Arnold would come by and the two this morning and pick me up and we'd go over there and then we'd eat afterwards. Mm-hmm. We'd go down to the marina and we ate at this place called Jamaica Bay Inn. They'd have the chicken and a whole dead lunch thing and then we'd go out and sit by the pool and take a swim. They never even questioned us just because we, we hung out there and they didn't want to talk, they didn't want to ask us to leave. So. No, <laughs> one, one thing I've always been curious about is when, I, I've only heard Arnold say this, but he'd say he was in the gym for five hours a day. Was that five hours straight, or is it two sessions, two and a half, two and a half, or? I never know I'm gonna ever be there for five hours. <sighs> I think if you were gonna do two body parts, for example, we'd do chest and back, you'd probably get done maybe an hour and 15 minutes. That's actually pretty quick. Yeah, but you can do it. If you're two guys training, you're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's really all it takes, hour and 15, hour and 30 minutes. If you start going over that, you get too tired and you get overtrained. Mm. Now, he'd go back maybe later in the day and do calves and abs, because he wouldn't do it then, but that that's where it stretched out to be another hour. But no, not all at once. Nobody trains all day long, five, six hours. If you did, you end up looking like a peanut, because you train your body down so far, it wouldn't respond. Mm-hmm. You can't do that to muscle. You can't kill it like that. It won't respond. And we would, we would split the body parts up, like chest and back one day, shoulders and arms the next, and legs the next. So each body part was twice a week. I was just gonna ask, yeah. Yeah, twice a week worked really well. I mean, when I first started, I did three times a week uh, because that's what the guys did in the 50s. You couldn't do as many sets and reps, but I got results. But when you went to twice a week and you had those rest days, then you really started getting some notice like that. But now I'm doing once a week, uh, which I never believed in, but it seems to work. Once a week's plenty. I, today I did back, yesterday I did chest, tomorrow I'll do shoulders, next day I'll do arms. I can't do legs right now until this um, surgery heals up on my leg, but once I'm back doing those, that'll be fun again. The way you train now, how often do you go? I go every day. Seven days a week? Yeah. Oh, what else wow. I got to do at my age? Sit in the old age home? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I get up and I leave the house, have my breakfast, I leave the house, I go to the gym, I pick a body part, I work it, hang out there for a while, meet some people, have on my show, and then I go to Starbucks, grab some coffee, maybe hit the market if I need something, have lunch, come home, and then I start my shows. And then I do my editing, and by five, six o'clock, I'm done. Uh, maybe go out for coffee with a friend, and go have dinner and come back, and I'm done for the night. Easy lifestyle. It's easy. No, no, no. no. I, I, I was, I was surprised you said seven days a week because I mean, if anyone's earned, you know, taking it easy in the gym is you. I know. I catch a lot of crap from my kids, um, and old girlfriends and ex-wives who say, "Why do you have to go every day?" I don't have to go every day. I just desire to because I have nothing else to do at that time. So it gets me out of the house, and it's, it's like a place of business for me. I meet new people all the time. I meet people from out of, the, out of the country who recognize me. I meet people who have as guests, and so it's the way I start my day like an office. Maybe I'll just go in and ride the bike. I can't now with my leg like this, so I can't even go in just to ride the bike. But I would do that maybe on an off day and meet some people and just leave, but it just gets me out. I, my mom was 90-something years old. She lived until 97. She'd get up in the morning, go have coffee with friends at this little coffee shop. She says, I gotta get out of the house. I gotta be out around people and circulate. You sit in the house and you don't go out, you die. You sit there, you die, that's it. I've had a lot of injuries and people say, why aren't you staying home just sitting on the couch and relaxing? Because I said, I'll die, that's it, I'll sit there on the couch. TV will come on, by the time it hits its third commercial, I'm dead, that's it. Yeah, and I mean, when you sit at home all day, you get restless. I don't like it at all. I was in the hospital once for five days and then another six and I was going crazy. Although the nurses keep waking you up for stuff so you, you don't really get to sleep a lot. But just to be in a bed and be confined like that, no, I don't like it. You know, a lot of people don't realize the gym is a great place to network. Totally. You know, I, I've met plenty of people in the gym that, you know, uh, help me out in just about uh, my everyday life. Yeah. You know, and, and people are so intimidated by that um, in regards to introducing themselves to people. The way I meet people is whether you have headphones on or not, because I go to the gym, I'm there for results. Mm-hmm. If I'm going heavy on bench or whatever I'm doing, I say, hey, can you give me a spot? And then from there, it blossoms into a friendship. Even if it's just in the gym, right. just meeting people, right. um, that's it's a it's a fantastic place to meet people. And, and when you can take that relationship outside of the gym, yeah, that makes it even better because now you have a friend outside. Well, it's true, and and because of the years I put in, because people know me, they always want to talk to me and they gravitate to me, and so I make friends like that, which actually works out pretty well because I like to talk to people. I learn from others. I don't know everything, but I learn from talking to somebody about trying something and doing something different. Women are all there. I don't really mess with them because I don't be one of those guys that hits on every chick in the gym. I don't think it's important for me to do that. And they're too busy looking at their asses on their cell phones anyway, which I think is ridiculous because who cares? So maybe I got to that age where I just don't care. Um, 
but they'll approach me and you know I'm too old for most of them in my mind but in their mind no you're not I met a 27 year old I said you know I'm 74 she's I don't care I don't what? care yeah age means nothing to me you've got history you're smart you know a lot more than I do I'll learn from you and so I said okay I mean if that's what you want to do fine it's a good girl but you're the same age as my daughter <laughs> and my daughter will say daddy what are you doing what are you thinking I had a 23 year old that I came over here and I went out with who was a fitness model and she, I had a great time with her we had a lot of fun we talked about a lot of stuff she wasn't stupid at all and um, I did feel a little funny being with someone that young, but she didn't. Women are different. They don't care. Mm -hmm. They really don't care how old you are, unless you're you know, so decrepit and old that you can't even walk and you got one foot in the grave. But no, if you're athletic and you're in shape and, and as handsome and sexy as I am, <laughs> it makes a big difference. You know, speaking of like these young uh, women, what, what, what's your opinion on like these girls on Instagram? Like basically, uh, shaking it for for attention. That's what I was just talking about. I see him in the gym with their fake butts and their their what are they yeah. called? Like the bands, the resistance yeah, bands. Yeah, doing the bands, doing kickbacks, and the other girl's taking a picture of her doing it, and she's taking a picture of her butt. Yeah. And I said to one day, I said, a butt's a butt. If you want to look at a good butt, look at mine. I have a round butt, and I just put a picture up from my 20-year high school reunion, and I had a pair of white pants on and a, and a tucked-in Hawaiian shirt. Two women went on there and said, do you see the ass on him? The other one said, yeah, I was just going to say. Because I've always been told, you got this nice round butt, but I just got it from just working out and doing lunges, or maybe it was genetic or something. But I didn't have to get a fake one, and I certainly don't make a big deal about it like they do. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter. I didn't care. I wouldn't care if they had a flat, but if they had a good brain and some sense of humor and something to talk about, I'm fine with that. You know, it's crazy. I was just, the entire time you were telling me that, like, I can't believe you're wearing white pants. Like, that's, that's just so fascinating to me because... Uh, with, with I, I, I wear only black yeah for the most part that's only for funerals yeah you know I gotta I gotta diversify my, my wardrobe but no no I'm going way back this is a high school reunion but it was summertime it was 110 degrees up there I had a nice pair of white pants and it's kind of an orange green and something Hawaiian shirt and I looked at the picture I said wow that looks pretty good like that um, but I liked white pants except you're only good for one night and you get them dirty and that's it mm -hmm. but I had white and beige and all these other types of red if you had I had red pair of pants and you know I do wear a lot of black now just because everything I get sent to me is usually a black t-shirt and black pants. Do you think, like, because social media is so big now, do you think that social media is, I don't know how to put this, like, is it ruining the gym experience? I mean, it's getting people into the gym, but I, I feel from what I see, people are just really more into like how many likes I can get as opposed to actually working out or doing something better. Well, that's what it is nowadays. I use it for, for business. I put on tips from training, uh, put on my status of my health with my leg right now, people are interested in what I had done, uh, all kinds of stuff like that. But uh, it, it's gotten out of hand. It's, it is about numbers and numbers and numbers. Look how many people, look how many followers, look at this, look at this. And who really cares? Unless that's bringing you dollars, it doesn't mean anything. You have to turn it into money somehow. You have to turn it into like, I monetize my channel. I have products on my channel that people can buy and so I use it towards that most of these people today don't the girls just want to show their ass and everybody has an ass mm -hmm. so I don't think it's really important I don't know why they do that but they do well they do it for attention a lot of them are just attention yeah very very insecure you know? people yeah and if you talk to them they won't even talk to you because they they're so insecure they're stuck up because they don't even know what to say if you say hello they're stuck for an answer one girl came out of the dressing room one day and I know her actually she's a little bit older and she always told me, you're going to be my husband in my next life. I said, well, I don't know if I'll ever get married again. Probably not. So she comes out one day. I said, come here, man. I want to tell you something. I had this friend of mine with me. Because I'll say anything. I said, I just wanted to tell you something really sincere. As long as I have a face, you'll always have a seat. Oh, snap. And she, looked at, <laughs> and she looked at me, and she looked at me, and she just stared at me. She grabbed her chest, and she took a deep breath. She says, Rick, I said, what? Well, you say the nicest things to me. Oh, my God, that worked. <laughs> He said, how the fuck do you get away with that shit? I don't know, I just do. You know, I'm glad you dropped the F-bomb. Because I, I was trying to catch myself not cursing. Yeah, well, so. I, I don't do it all the time, but that was, that had to be. So, I mean, sometimes you get away with stuff. And it's mm -hmm. just the way you approach people, because I can usually get away with a lot just by the way I approach people. And they're never offended by it. So I have fun with it. Yeah, it's all about how you present it. Right. Because you know? if, you, if, you, if you're staring at a girl across the gym and you just happen to start talking to her and then you say that, yeah. there's going to be police officers walking in. No, I would never do that. I wouldn't do it to somebody that I just met for the first time. I'd have to talk to them for about five minutes and then maybe they'll come How in. was How were the girls back then? Were the girls, I don't know how many girls went into like Gold's Gym or World's Gym 
Wow. Well, going back then on Gold's gym, it was made for men. Joe Gold built the gym for his buddies on the beach that were paddle tennis players and the bodybuilders, and he built it for them. Uh, he put one dressing room upstairs with one shower, one toilet. That was for the guys. He had a heater put in for the city of permit, but the heater didn't work because he said no one's going to use it anyway. The showers he didn't really care much about because he says nobody takes showers anyway. They just go to the beach and go in the ocean, which is true. So two girls joined the gym. They wanted to work out with the guys. I remember them very well. And so, and, and there was another one that was about six feet tall with a red rainbow natural hairstyle, like, and she had a huge dog. So I was up in the shower one day and I turn around, she's behind me, she's, Rick, would you hand me the soap, please? She's showering right there. I said, yeah, here you go. But it got to be like that. And then when they moved the goals over to Second Street in Santa Monica, the same thing happened. I'm in the shower and some girl runs in to give me a birthday card. She said, why don't you come over to my place? And I live under the pier. I said, Okay. Well, like literally under the pier? I said, yeah, she had an apartment under the pier. Oh. I said, you, you already saw me <laughs> naked, so we got that part out of the way. <laughs> so, I mean, stuff like that would happen all the time. It was easy in the 70s. I mean, you go down to the beach, and I met some girl in the sand. I said, How about, where do you live? She's up there. I said, let's go. It was that easy. It was that easy. That's crazy. Ridiculously easy. Uh, you didn't have to work for anything. But that's life. Yeah, the good old days. Yeah. That's... that's <laughs> it's really not any different today if you play it right. I mean, I don't have any issues today with anything if I want. But um, it just depends how you play it. Just except now, these days, I just don't feel like running around. I'm just Not that I'm older and tired, but I don't want to put up with the crap. Mm -hmm. I feel you on that. I just don't feel like it. It's, <laughs> it's not worth it to me. No. Now, going again, going back to those days, I, I know the story, and I know a lot of people on your show are listening. They know the story. But when did you uh, meet Arnold? How did you meet Arnold? I was training at Bill Pearl's gym in Inglewood. I was living in Torrance, working for Kellogg Cereal as a salesman, selling cereal. That's what got me out of my hometown to get a job and come down and give me a car and expense account. But it's not what I wanted to do. I used to go to markets and I ended up giving the managers routines to work out. So I was at Pearl's and someone said, why don't you go to Gold's? I said, I never heard of Gold's. Where is it? He says, down in Venice. I said, never heard of the gym in my life. So I went down there one day and I walked in, back door, and there's Arnold and a couple of guys. And he looked at me and I looked at him and he introduced himself and so did I and I said, I think I'm going to work out here today. He says, where are you going to work? I said, I don't know, maybe I'll do some chest and benches. He says, come on, do them with me. So we did and we became friends and he was a good bencher and I was a good bencher. And uh, what are you going to do tomorrow? I said, I don't know, whatever you want. Just let me know, I'll show up. And it just took off from there. How often did you guys train together? Uh, almost every day. Really? Yeah. Yeah. He and I and Roger Callard and a couple of other guys and Franco. And Franco kind of went off on his own a bit because Franco was like really strong. And Franco's a good friend. I had him on the show just this past year. He's he's really a good guy. Um, strong as a bull. He's, he's a chiropractor or something. Yeah, right? strong as a bull. Um, it was just that easy. And then Arnold introduced me to Joe Weeder, who would come in on Sundays. Now, Joe would come in, and he would just grab the 65-pound dumbbells and just start curling them. I said, how the hell do you do that? I'm strong, Rick. You know, I had a lot of strength in my day when I was working out, and all the girls liked me. So he was like, well, that's how he talked. And so he took us all to lunch at the Jamaica Bay Inn. And that time I had done the Gold's Gym logo. Mm -hmm. I drew it on the t-shirt and I drew it on the and went on the t-shirts. They started selling the shirts. So I came out with other designs and I put them in a couple of uh, like muscular development, Iron Man magazine because they were cheap. And I started selling mail order. So Joe says, why don't you put your shirts in my magazine? I said, I can't afford your magazine. It's like $1,000 a month. And he says, well, if you model my products for me, I'll give you free ad space. Wow. Full page. I'll have my art department make it up in color. You can have everything you want in there. So I added t-shirts, tank tops, baseball caps, a license plate frames that said I'd rather be pumping iron, and keychains with a little bodybuilder on because I worked for a company that had hot stamp plastic and I had those made. And boy, he was right. I started making money. It was There was no internet. It was just letters written in with checks. I'm doing about 80,000 bucks a year out of my garage here. Get out of here, really? No, really good money. I built myself a silk screening press out there and the dryers and all the things I need to print t-shirts. Taught myself how to do it, and I was knocking out about 100 and 200 shirts a day and stacking them, and then filling the orders and putting them in bags and running them to the post office every other day. Um, it got to be a big job and a tiring job, but I did it for a long time, and I made a lot of money. Was that your only job while you were bodybuilding? Uh, no. I was um, wrestling at night, mm. um, doing commercials, um, working in movies. Back then, you can get a lot of work. A lot of variety shows on NBC and CBS with Cher and Johnny Carson and Flip Wilson and all those Sammy Davis Jr. So we always got hired for those shows. And then once you'd work and you collect unemployment when you're not working, and then you get residuals. And when you get the residuals, you don't collect unemployment. So it kind of just 
rotates itself, and then I'd wrestle at night and make cash, and then I had the mail order business, so I had money from all different angles, and I still have today. I've always had, I've always worked different angles to have like three or four incomes. So it worked out okay. Wrestling here was easy because it was the Olympic Auditorium downtown twice a week in small towns around here, three or four nights a week, and I was home all day, didn't have to eat till four or five. Mm -hmm. So uh, that type of life was great. You know, you do your thing, come home about 11 at night, and get up and go to the gym, and your day would start over. When did you start wrestling? I started in 1965. I was living in Bakersfield, training at the YMCA. My father died in 63, and he used to take me to the wrestling matches. And at the YMCA on Thursdays, all these wrestlers would come to town to do the show that night, and they would come to the YMCA, two or three of them, to work out. So I just started talking to them about the business, and they said, yeah, it's okay, you know, if you want to train, you got to you got to have somebody who trains you to get into the business, and there's no schools. But if you want to talk to Johnny May Young, you remember May Young? Oh, my God, really? And they said, she'll train you, but you got to go see her down at the Olympic Auditorium. So I said, okay. I remember I had a 56 Chevy, and I didn't have a spare tire. But I drove to L.A., and I took my mom with me because my father had passed away. She says, oh, you don't want to go into wrestling. I said, I was in a guitarist in the band. I was doing really well playing on weekends. Mm -hmm. I played every Friday and Saturday night and made money in the band. So I said, no, I think it's something I want to do. It's the entertainment business. Let's just go see how it goes. So we drove down to the Olympic, and she had a, a little makeshift ring upstairs and took me in there, and she said, let me see your body. I said, it's going to cost you 20 bucks. Wait, who would you say this to? Johnny May Young. Oh, my God. It cost you 20 bucks. I don't show my body to anybody for free. But maybe you, because you're a lesbian. So, Wait, was she? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I learned something new yeah, today. Yeah, she laughed at me. And I took my shirt off. She said, oh, my God, Rick. She says, I can make some money with you. There's nobody built other than Earl Maynard at the time, Mr. Universe. The rest of the guys were just out of shape, fat guys. Of course, they didn't like me because I was built. Mm -hmm. So she says, I'll charge you $25 a class. Come down here. You do two hours in the ring, maybe three. Go home, come back on certain days, and we'll, we'll work it out. Well, $25 a class in 1965 was a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Um, they, that's like 250 today. But I would drive every day, five days a week, down to the Olympic, either at 10 in the morning or 2 in the afternoon or 8 o'clock at night, and she'd train me for two hours. Then I'd go back and I'd hit the gym for a couple hours, and I'd play at night in my band, make some money. And after about six months, they put me on Channel 5 uh, to wrestle Buddy Killer Austin, who I didn't really want to work with because he was like crazy drunk. But I worked with him, and it was fine. Mm -hmm. And then I did the uh, KMX, KMEX Channel 34, which is a Hispanic channel. And I started doing TV at the Olympic and working every night here and there. And after six months, after I did that for six months, I said, I'd like to try to go somewhere else. So I went down to, I went to Oregon. I worked there for a while. Then I went down to the south of Alabama and Florida, worked there for a while, over to Montreal. And then I met Vern Gagne. Remember Vern Gagne? I do, yeah. Well, I met him at a club here in L.A. through a, a, a cousin of his. Well, actually, Cowboy Bill Watson, somebody else. And I said, I wrestle. He says, oh, he says, really? And we were out by the airport. He says, do you ever want to come to me? I'll take you. He says, you look great, I'll take you, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you in. So I guess time went by and I wrote him a letter, I said, I think I'm ready. He said, I'll give you a start date, and I went back there and I worked, and they paid big money. Mm -hmm. Billy Superstar Graham was there, and he was a friend of mine, he said, Rick, you gotta come back here. He says, the checks are so heavy, I can hardly carry them to the bank. Are you kidding me? So I went back there and I went to Graham's house for dinner, and he had like 50 pieces of chicken on the table. I had my wife, eat, eat, eat. I said, Bill, I can't eat like you. You're, you're 300 pounds, I can't eat five pieces of chicken, you know, like 14 hamburgers on a Sunday. But it was an experience working with those guys. They were all real pros, and um, they paid good money, and I felt really blessed that I could go to an area like AWA. You know, it was good for me. That's incredible. I had no idea. I, I mean, I knew you wrestled, yeah, but yeah. I, I didn't know. Yeah, it worked. I, actually, their, their uh, program book is almost like a, it's like you get a, at a carnival where you turn pages and all these different things going on there. So I'm in there with him on one page, and he's next to me on the other page. Billy Graham? Rick, yeah, Rick Drayson, Mr. California, All-American boy, you know, new to our, our area here. And he gave me a big build-up. So, uh, and Rick Flair was there at the time, just starting out. He was just starting out. He was hiding behind a curtain looking at me, like pulling the curtain, pulling the curtain. And um, it's just kind of fun. I mean, you know, they Dick the Bruiser and all those guys back then. But, you know, starting the business then, as I, I think I was like 21, in good shape, the old time guys would they give you they stiff you in the ring. They make mm -hmm. you you know, they want you to know this is not easy. And if you complain, then go home. But I never complained. I said, No, I'm not gonna complain. Nope. I remember coming out to the Olympic Auditorium one night and I had my girlfriend with me from Bakersfield and another couple and I'm parked in such a manner that I can't get out of the parking lot because our match ended early and it's there's another sidewalk and there's a stop sign and there's the curb. So I said, shit, I want to get out of here so bad. I went over and I yanked on the stop sign, pulled it out of the ground, drove over the top of it, put the sign back down and took off. And there were two people sitting in the car looking at me like, 
he said, I actually pulled the stop sign out of the ground. I want it out of there. <laughs> but those are just funny stories that things happen like that. And it's... Well, re rewinding a little bit, going back to Mae Young, the, the training that she, because I, I, I've heard stories of the training back in the days, and it's, it's, it's no joke. Mm -hmm. What kind of training did she have you guys do? Well, there wasn't guys. There was me and about two or three girls and one other guy. Um, she taught us American style. Mm -hmm. She taught us Japanese and Mexican style because they work on the right. And then she taught us shoot style because she says, they're going to try and stiff you. You need to know how to get out of holes and how to apply things and, and give it back to them. So she taught us, we, she taught me all that stuff. You had to know every style there was. And so I did, and I learned it. And then shortly after that, a year or two later, they started bringing in the Mexican wrestlers, and they don't speak English. Mm -hmm. So I worked with them in the ring, and a lot of them had masks on. But I could work on the right, I could work on the left, it didn't really matter to me. Sometimes you get a little confused. You know, what a potato is, right? They hit you with a potato, they hit you really hard. I told the guy, no more, and he hit me again. I said, I told you no more, and I grabbed his mask and right here, and I pulled on my smacked him really hard in the forehead until his eyes just kind of crossed, and <laughs> he went back. I said, I told you no more, and after that he was okay. But you had, that's how you did it back then. You had to give it back a little bit, you know, and other, otherwise they're going to walk all over you. As far as like training, um, wrestling and bodybuilding, because I know wrestling burns a ton of calories. Yeah. You know, because there's being in shape and then there's being in ring shape. Ring shape's different. It's, you can do an elliptical for 45 minutes, easy. You go in the ring for a minute and a half, you suck the wind. Yeah. Steve <laughs> Austin was over here and when Austin said, he said, I'd have to train five months in your ring to get back in shape to do a match. Really? He says, yep. Yeah. I'm out of shape. But if you run those ropes for about two minutes, that's the end of you. Finding it hard to breathe now, just thinking Yeah, it's, it's like, the end of you. That'll knock you right out. And people think they're in shape till they get in there. Mm -hmm. Then if you take bumps with it, you know, forward bumps, backward bumps, and run the ropes and run back and forth, do another forward bump, run back and forth, you're dead. And so many people think, but they call me to want to train. Oh, it looks easy. It's like a trampoline, isn't it? I said, no, it's not a trampoline. It hurts. That mat hurts and the ropes hurt. You just, you, you just got to get used to it. If you hit the ropes the right way, they don't hurt. If you fall the right way, it doesn't hurt, but it takes a lot while to learn it because you'll, you'll bite your tongue nine times out of 10 the first time, you'll snap your neck several times, give yourself a headache, and have bruises from the ropes, and this is just how it is, and, and Matt burns. Yeah, you know, that's, that's one thing that, lack of a better term, pisses me off. Yeah. When people use the F word, yeah. ink, and, oh, it's a trampoline, it's a bed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, you'll never forget your first bump. Nope. You know, it's, it's, actually my first one wasn't that bad. My second one was the one. Well, the was first like, one I took is when I trained with her and it was a hardwood floor with just a mat on it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a ring. It was like a ring, but then the big ring was downstairs and that was a boxing ring at the Olympic and it was 25 feet. That's a big ring. Wait, across that? Yeah. Wow. When you run 25 feet, you're running. Because most of them were 18 to 20. Mm -hmm. That makes a big difference. It had a big, long, big white apron on it. Yeah, there's nothing fake about it. Well, don't you know who wins? I said, so? You still got to get there. You got to do the show from point A to point B. Whether who wins or not doesn't really matter. It's just how you get there and how you put the show on. You know, one of my favorite rebuttals for that is like, oh, you know, wrestling's fake, right? Yeah, you know what else is fake? Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. Fast and Furious, mm -hmm. all that stuff you watch on TV. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. fake. Mm -hmm. You know, and then and, and then they're like, oh yeah, I guess. But um, it's 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 about it's the most real sport in my opinion because you you have to be so conscious of the other person's well being. Um, conscious of your well-being, conscious of what's going on around you. There's so much to know. Um, you just don't get in and start running and, and doing hijinks. You've got to know how to tell a story, mm -hmm. the beginning, the middle, and the ending. You've got to be able to sell it, facial expressions, body language, all the stuff that goes on. And you're working in a circle, so you're working in theater and around. You have to sell every part of the audience. And people don't realize that. They think, oh, it's just easy. Just go in and hit somebody and jump around. And it's not like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's people are so like, oh, you know, uh, Hulk Hogan and you know Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, Ric Flair, they're, they're great uh, wrestlers, don't get me wrong, but then there's people who are underappreciated, yeah. like Shawn Michaels, yeah. uh, great storyteller, yeah. uh, like William Regal, yeah. you know, people like that, Brian Kendrick, mm -hmm. you know, people like that, that just get overlooked because they're not super megastars, but the fact that those superstars go to these guys for advice, mm -hmm. trying to learn how to do certain mm -hmm. things, or, you know, what can I do to be better? So it's, it's the people that you don't realize or, uh, I guess, quote-unquote, appreciate um, until you actually step in the ring to actually uh, appreciate what they do and how they do it. Well, back then, they would run the show. They'd have a promoter and a booker. Then they would have the group of guys in the office, and you would have the top heel and the top face, 
and then you had publicity, and you had a couple of more people. And the top heel and top face would, would book the matches with people they thought could work well together. So it was really old school. They're, they're the ones that put it together. When you show up at night, your name's on the board matches, six matches. You could be anywhere from one to six. You could be in a tag, you could be a single, you could be a battle royal, doesn't matter. And they put you where they thought you would work the best. And then they would tell you who's going over and who's not. And then you got to work the finish up. And that's it. But it, um, you never had any practice with anybody outside the ring. You talked it as you went in the ring. You know, you called it as you went. You hit me there, do this, do that, come on over there. I'll, I'll sell, throw me out of the ring, I'll come back in, I'll come out for you, you go out. And people don't realize you're talking the whole time as you're, as you're doing it, but this is how it worked, and it just worked really well. Today, if you try to memorize everything, how can you? If you're going 20 minutes, what if you get to your third or fourth move and you say, oh my God, what comes next? That happens. With the style that's on the indies now. Yeah, like, you got to know how to call it as you go. It's like a comedian that gets up there and they get lost in the routine. They better have a backup. They better have to know how to work the audience so that they can keep the show going. Because if they don't, they're dead. Mm -hmm. you know, right then, they just might as well go home. That's definitely a lost yeah. art form. Being yeah. as a quote unquote call it in the ring. Yeah, it is. And and when you're when you're training guys, that's one of the things that I think should be done more often. Um, having like new guys learn how to just call it in the ring, because and also learning how to work around time limits and cutting time, adding time. Hey, guess what? Now you have three minutes. Go. Yeah. You know, calling it in the ring, stuff like that. It's just there's so much more to it than flips and. You know. Well, you got to know when the referee says, you know, uh, two minutes left, one minute left, take it home. Mm -hmm. You got to go into your finish and don't mess up your finish because it's a one-time finish. I had guys wrestle broomsticks out here, or they wrestled the Invisible Man, because I said if you can do that, then you can carry a match. You're wrestling somebody, you got to take bumps from, you got to do this, do that, like there's somebody with you, and just do it to the best of your knowledge, and you'll learn how to work with somebody, and it worked really well. Mm -hmm. So um, there's ways around it. Um, some people never get it. They can't take a headlock. They, they can't go around a headlock takeover. They can't do a snap mirror. Um, they just can't do them. Well, that's just like with anything that you do in life. Yeah. Um, there's some people like LeBron James, the best basketball player in the world. Yeah. I suck at basketball. You know, it's just the. It depends. Of course, genetics play a role in it. Mm -hmm. uh, how athletic you are, but at the same time, how much work you put into practice. Because there's a lot of people that that don't put in the work right. and they just do it whenever you know. But then there's people who study it, who put in yeah hundreds of hours. I always felt well, and I did, but I always felt by getting in the ring and doing it as we go, I learned a lot better. Mm -hmm. Same with the guitar. I could play guitar really well. I'm a great guitar player. That I practiced with the bands, I didn't want to. But when I got out on stage and played, I try new stuff. You know, step outside the box and take a risk of trying something and it always worked because it was new and there was people and so I thought, okay, this is how I do it. Same thing with wrestling. I try something I'd never done before and it worked because I had an audience behind me. If I was to do that in practicing, I might get hurt mm -hmm. because I'm not there 100%. So um, you need that motivation from someone to be behind you. It, it just keeps you going. Well, well going back to training, um, weight training. Yeah. How, how would you train? Because I know with wrestling, if you get hurt in the ring, it affects you in the gym. You know, you soar from the gym, it affects you in the ring. So how would you work around, especially keeping your size? What, what were you at your, your top weight? 225, maybe. That's a lot. I got as much as 239, but my, my weight normally was around 218, 220. So, I mean, staying around that, you need to eat a lot as it is. Um, you do, but sir, so right now I'm 222. Um, I don't eat a lot of food. I eat beef patties and eggs and cottage cheese most of the time. And my weight stayed up. I was taking some testosterone too, which helped me you know, stay a little bit fuller. But not a lot. I don't know. I just stayed. I just stayed in that shape. Wrestling at night it wore me out. The next day I go to the gym. Yes, I was sore. I had some pulled muscles, but I'd work around it. Somehow you work through it, and you bitch a little bit that it would hurt you, but you still would get through it. You do an exercise that maybe you couldn't do or you could do, and you just do ones that do that work, and those that don't, you don't do them. Um, I tore both quads in 2001 in the ring. I tore one one night. I duct taped it, iced it, came home. Limped around, the next day I fell out the back door and I ripped the other one. So two days later I'm in the hospital having my quads redone and that was six weeks in leg braces. Well, that's a ring injury that I didn't want and it took me back a little bit. I couldn't do legs for a long time until they healed up. So that's one of the injuries from wrestling that was a big one. Um, had a knee replacement two years ago, which was doing fine. Now I had this little thing with a vein in my leg that they tied off because it was bleeding. That's not a big deal. That'll heal up in the next few weeks and it should be okay. So you do have injuries. Um, you're always pulling a muscle. You know, your shoulders kill you from the arthritis, from throwing punches and lifting weights at the same time. And just and some people don't have any injuries. Some people never get hurt. I don't know how they do it, but 
It's like Chris Jericho. Yeah, they just don't get hurt. <laughs> he's he's never been, injured. He's been over here before, too, and he said, no, nah, I don't have any injuries. I have nothing. I said, lucky you, man. And he's been doing it almost as long as I've been alive. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and he's still in, uh, yeah. in New Japan by any chance? Yeah. He's their intercontinental champion over there. Yeah. You know, and, and he, he's someone that's so underappreciated and undervalued. Not, not necessarily undervalued. But, again, he's not one of those mega, mega stars, but he's someone that's so good that definitely needs more recognition for the work that he does because he's 40, I don't know, five or something now. Yeah. And he's in great shape. He's working in Japan. He's doing his rock band thing. And he's another one of those guys that can tell those incredible stories, you know, that, mm -hmm. that just get overlooked because he's not one of those big, you know, Mount Rushmore names. It takes a lot of energy to do what he does. A sure lot, does. You have to have a lot of drive. And it's difficult. Mm. It's really difficult to do. But he does it. Ric Flair the same way. Ric Flair never gave up. He just kept moving and doing. And even in the 60s, he's still out there doing what he wanted to do and never complained. It's not easy. I mean, he's had tons of injuries and health per health problems, but this is all part of it. Now, when you were mentioning, uh, like going back to bodybuilding, was it more like hush and tell when it came to PEDs? Or were you guys open about that? Back then, we were open about it. Today, everybody, I mean, everybody's so down on that stuff nowadays. I don't even know why. Big deal. So you take some testosterone or something. So what? Hmm. You know, um, women take estrogen. People take things to get their athletic ability. They put uh, nitro in cars so they go faster. And so if you're going to take a little something to be better at what you are, why not? It's not hurting anybody. It's a personal thing. But people say, well, you lied about it. You didn't tell me the truth. Some people do. They don't t tell you the truth because they don't want to. It's their business. They shouldn't have to worry about it. So back then there were very little drugs, uh, basics, but everybody took something. Mm -hmm. That's how you made your gains. You know, on that tight diet like that, you needed something to put you over the edge and give you the energy. So um, that's what we did, and it was all real stuff too. And it wasn't illegal. It was it was it was illegal starting weight in the late '80s, mm -hmm. but back in the '60s and '70s it wasn't illegal. You can get it anywhere. So you guys were, hey, I'm taking A, B, and C. Yeah, and it was just yeah, get it from the doctor. Here you go. Was it easy to get it from yeah, there? Yeah, it's no problem. Because it wasn't illegal. Mm -hmm. So the people today bitch about it on my show. Why, don't you, why are people doing it? They shouldn't be doing it. They're lying. They're taking an easy way out. You know what? That's their business. Whatever they want to do, they can do. You know, people don't realize. They think it's like a magic pill. It's not. Oh, oh you're going to get jacked all of a sudden. You actually have to train harder, eat cleaner. You do. It's, it's a lot more work than just being a normal gym guy. You yeah. Know? You got it. You got it. It's, it's not a magic thing. It has to work along with your training and your diet. Mm -hmm. They work all together. Testosterone and all these other anabolics work off what you put in your body as far as nutrients because it makes it go to the right places and your training goes along with it. If you do this by yourself and you don't train hard and don't eat right, you're just going to get fat and pimples. I've seen it happen all the time. These guys are taking all this juice and they're fat all full of pimples in the gym. It's like, yeah. why don't you clean your diet out and yeah. train right? And it's not about training heavy and throwing heavy weights around. It's about training systematically and getting to feel the weight as it goes up and down and take your time with it. I never understood people who did that. No. Uh, just take it, just to take it. Yeah. And, and, and it shows, like, okay, we know you're on it, but you, you look like crap. Yep. You know? But, hey, you know what? The people that are open about it and train hard and they're strict on their diet, like, preparing for a contest, mm -hmm. I, I've never done it, obviously, but, like, the, the Olympias now, or you're training for the Arnold, wherever it is, tr preparing for those contests, making sure it's exactly five ounces of chicken, half a cup of rice, yeah. and all that stuff, it's a science. It is. You know, and it's, it's very tedious, and it's just, it, it kind of irks me when people say, oh, you know, it's the easy way out. If anything, it's harder. It's very hard, and, and I would never do that today like that. I just go back to, like I had a hamburger patty and eggs for lunch with some cantaloupe. Today? Yeah, that's it. Um, I don't analyze what I do. I just eat what works for me, and that diet works for me. Mm. But people, they, they know, what about your macros? What about this, and how many calories? And how many? I don't know. I don't ever count them. Probably get 2,000 calories a day. It's not a whole lot. That's about all I get, though. Well, when you were training back in the 70s, were you more aware of what you, how much you ate, I guess, when you were... Well, I was aware of my diet. I didn't want to deviate from it. My mom tried to get me over for dinner and eat some stuff I didn't want to eat. But my diet was clean with no, no carbs during the week at all. Really? Yeah. So how would you put on size without... With the, with the steroids. Oh. Because you're you're training hard, you're getting enough. You got to get a lot of protein, and then that just enhances it a little mm -hmm. bit. And you, you put on good quality muscle. You just don't put on fat. Well, what were you taking back then? What was the what was the staple of that? Deca and Test and D Ball, maybe Winstrol, one of those. We trade off. 
But those were the four basics, maybe Anavar, which I never felt, didn't do a thing for me. But testosterone was the basis, and DECA is okay, it kills your sex drive, so I didn't want to do that too much. Uh, Winstrol and D-Ball were the best. The original D-Ball that came out back in the 60s from the pharmacy, from SIBA, best stuff ever. You take two pills and you're huge within two weeks. Wow. This stuff worked, but you can't get it. Now they have 25 milligram D-Ball, I don't even know if they're any good or who makes them. Did you guys take injectables or? Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that injectables work better than orals? You take them together. I had a theory behind that. I don't know if I'm right or not. When I was sick, the doctor would give me a penicillin shot. That's a booster shot. Then he gave me penicillin pills to take along with it. Mm -hmm. So the shot got the ball going and the pills kept them going. So if you took a shot of testosterone and you took the D-ball with it, pretty much it's the same principle in my head. Mm -hmm. And it worked. Pretty good. Now going back to the training, because uh, there weren't too many supplements as in regards to like protein and pre-workouts and stuff like that. What would you guys take for energy before you went to the gym? Because for me, today I went to the gym, I took my pre-workout and I did not want to be there. There was no pre-workout. I would have my beef patty and eggs in the morning and that was my food before the gym. Maybe in the afternoon a can of tuna fish out of the can was a, like instead of a protein drink. Mm -hmm. But no, I didn't, there was no pre-workout, maybe coffee, a cup of coffee, that was it. Because there was nothing you could buy that was a pre-workout. They didn't have it. Okay. I mean, it, it, this stuff just fascinates me. Like, <laughs> just knowing what it was, because I know what's out there now and yeah. how different it is now, but knowing what you guys did back then, it was just so simple and it worked. Yeah. And that's just something that's so overlooked and forgotten now. Because yeah. everyone's like, oh, I need to, uh, there's fads. You know, just like well, that thing. Well, they say less is more. Mm -hmm. And it is more. Um, you, you want to get a cap off a bottle and just squeeze real hard, you can't get it. Someone else comes along and they open it. Well, they, you're trying too hard. You don't have to try that hard to get stuff done. You don't have to overtrain. Yeah, I've done 20, 25 sets for bicep. That's too many. I do eight now and it works just as well. Mm -hmm. So um, you don't have to do that much. And in your mind when you're younger, you feel like you have to just keep going, going. I see guys in the gym overtraining all the time. And you can't tell them because they think they have to do every last rep. Oh no, I got to get two more sets over here or I'll, I'll, I won't have any muscle left. So I know the feeling, I know, I know how that works mentally and it does and you just can't do that. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't really work like that. You've got to let your, your body grow. Is that rest time too. Well, speaking of rest time, how, because I, I know you go seven days a week now, but when you were mm -hmm. training hard back then, um, were you in there seven days a week? No, I would take off maybe Wednesday and uh, Sunday. And now as far as uh, rest in between sets, how long would your breaks be? 20 seconds. All right, you guys, thank you for watching Rick's Corner with Nick, and uh, it's going to be his podcast, as I said. And so I gave you guys a good hour of pretty interesting conversation, stuff you won't find anywhere else, and we'll see you all next time. Don't forget to order the Goals Gym logo. Christmas is coming up. It's going to make a wonderful gift for somebody you know. I'll sign it and autograph it to them, and you can order it from me. It's on my website, rickdrazen.com. See you guys next time. Hey, everyone. Now you can have the Goals Gym logo drawn by me, the artist Rick Drazen personalized and made out to you and signed by me to frame and put on your gym wall or wherever you see fit to do so. It's a piece of bodybuilding history. It will never be duplicated again. It's the largest selling icon t-shirt logo in the world. And I'm the guy that drew it. And I will draw it for you. Just go to my website, rickdrazen.com and order there. You can pay through PayPal and it'll be sent out right away. And be sure to watch Rick's Corner for all the videos on bodybuilding, nutrition, fitness, pro wrestling, and anything that suits your interests as far as getting physically fit and being the best you can be from the golden era of bodybuilding. Baby, see you next time.